Dr. Detlef Thieme. Dr. Detlef Thieme is the director of the Institute of Doping, Analytics and Sports Biochemistry Dresden in Kreischer, Germany. His laboratory is accredited, accredited by the World Anti-Doping Agency, by the WADA, uh, where he was member of different scientific commissions. Together with Dr. Professor Axel Urhausen, he is also in the Medical Commission of the German National Anti-Doping Agency, NADA. Dr. Thiemer is a researcher in the development of the applied basic methods and the implementation of new analytical approaches in anti-doping. His main research topics include erythropoietin, growth hormone, 19 North steroid, and especially hair analysis. Doping in sports is one of the biggest problems as we see in many examples in the past and of course also today. The anti-doping fight seems to be always one step behind the criminals. Therefore, we are very proud to present you one of the worldwide leaders in this field. Dr. Detlef Thieme gives us a lecture about innovative research in anti-doping. I think we are all very curious to hear about the newest innovations on this field <coughs> and hope to make sports fairer and safer for all athletes. Dr. Thieme. Yeah, thank you very much and good morning. Uh, and thank you very much for the invitation which I received some two years ago. And I've learned from this uh, that it's better to read the title before agreeing to the presentation because uh, innovative research is something critical in anti-doping as was already uh, mentioned in the uh, nice introduction. Um, uh, I come to this with my, in my uh, uh, second uh, slide. I tried to, to, to be a little bit systematic uh, to present uh, three chapters, proactive innovations, so new compounds, new substances which are available and which, which are evolving in the field. Something which I've called retrospective innovation, if this uh, exists, that means uh, new approaches to old problems. Uh, and finally, protective research, that means we spend quite a lot of time to prote protect athletes from uh, incorrect uh, doping uh, suspicions. And this is a, a major part, or this was a major part uh, of our research work, work uh, in, the, in the last years. So coming back to the problem, as, it, as, as mentioned in the, in the introduction, probably anybody has heard that this famous race between hair and hedgehog is uh, symbolic for athletes, cheating athletes and, uh, uh, and uh, anti-doping uh, scientists. I like the picture because here in this picture, the athlete is the lazy smoking guy and we, we are the running ones, so uh, I, don't mind, I don't mind the picture. And I, and I wouldn't uh, object against this because that's, that's a, a kind of nature. So just like the police officer is always behind the bank robber, so because they have the, the, the freedom to choice the bank and, and the timing. And this is kind of true for us as well. So it's, it's a part of the reality. Um, and uh, to outline this a little bit deeper, I tried to, to give you a systematic approach. So this is all I know about sports. Sports is about performance and it's helpful to have uh, strength and endurance. This is my knowledge about sports. Uh, and everything uh, which is about cheating is, is uh, or traditional cheating is shown here uh, in, in, in good old days it was anabolic steroids to uh, increase muscle. It was growth hormone to do the same somewhat later. Uh, and to uh, improve endurance, it is helpful to uh, uh, enhance oxygen transport capacity by increasing red blood cells, uh, which is traditionally done by blood transfusion, later by EPO. Um, and uh, nowadays there were a lot of new concepts coming up, which typically are one uh, stage uh, above. So it's no longer the, the natural hormones or the natural principles which, which are manipulated. It is some precursors or some, some uh, stimulators which, which are 
uh, used. So SAMS uh, selective uh, androgen receptor modulators are chemicals which behave like testosterone. Uh, and that works, that works well. Uh, so far, there are many, many candidates uh, on the market, but none of them is approved for clinical uh, administration or for, cl uh, for clinical uh, application. So in theory or in practice, they, they can be used and there are doping cases uh, out there. Uh, but is this a new concept and, and a fruitful and a, and, and a useful concept? Uh, we will see. Uh, LH ag agonist, that is a very, very uh, strange um, uh, concept. So precursor of testosterone are stimulated by those agents, by those drugs. In, in clinical applications, they are, they are used for diagnostic purposes or, or as a long-term administration uh, for uh, suppression of testosterone. So in, in uh, forensic um, uh, clinics, um, um, patients uh, get it for a, a kind of a chemical castration uh, to, to reduce their, their uh, testosterone. So anything but a doping agent, that's almost the opposite of it. Nevertheless, it's prohibited me by it. It is, it is um, on the prohibited list because on a short term basis, it could lead to a short increase of testosterone. Growth hormone can be stimulated by various precursor hormones, growth hormone releasing peptides, growth hormone releasing hormones, growth hormones hormone secretor groups. They, they are all doing the same. They increase the growth hormone and with this they increase the muscle growth. Uh, and um, the red blood cells can be improved by this new uh, group of compounds which are the so-called HIF-1-alpha stabilizer. What this means is they pretend that the uh, body, uh, the organism has a lack a deficiency in oxygen. So this is something like a, a chemical form of high altitude, train, high altitude training. The, the, the athlete's body believes there's a lack of oxygen and therefore erythropoietin is produced, therefore red blood cells are increased and the performance is enhancing. All those concepts are from a clinical uh, point of view logic. So you want to have performance, anything of those is helpful. But it's not only uh, the, game, uh, the game of a cheating athlete to increase performance. The, the other goal is not being caught. And uh, this, must be, this must be challenged. From a, from a uh, pharmacological point of view, there are some helpful benefits. For instance, the, admi the oral administration of those compounds. In, in clinical application, it's good to have a pill instead of the injection for long-term uh, treatment in particular, and, and those categories, SARMs, uh, growth hormone secretor gorks, or HIF-1-alpha stabilizers, they can be taken as pills, and that is very charming in, in uh, practical uh, administration. Is it helpful for athletes to, to, to take a pill instead of an at, uh, athlete uh, in order to cheat? I, I would doubt that this is the, the main barrier for, for, um, uh, for cheating. Uh, the other one is long action that is for clinical uh, purposes very helpful. So if long-term treatment of muscle deficiency by long-acting uh, arms uh, of, or of growth deficiency by long-acting uh, compounds, that may be very, very helpful in clinical practice or uh, HIF-1-alpha instead of, uh, of a positive EPO that may, may be very, very good for, for uh, treatments. But uh, long action means long detection. I personally did an excretion study on, on SARMS last year uh, with one-tenth of a single therapeutic dose which was detectable for more than 14 days without any performance enhancing effect. So you must keep in mind that all those uh, pharmaceutical benefits are not necessarily helpful for athletes because then they are positive for weeks and months if they are, uh, if they are cheating. And that's why the, these theoretical considerations, which are public, published everywhere, as the new upcoming uh, doping agency must be, must be critically uh, reviewed.
So in what I tried with this one. Well, I go back and then uh, uh, we, can, we can handle it. So this is a story from, uh, from uh, the uh, court case, which you have probably heard with the uh, physiologist who was uh, preparing blood transfusion for athletes, uh, the, 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 the so-called bloodletting, uh, Operation Bloodletting, where I was a uh, um, an expert witness in court and where I learned a lot about the, the practical background of those procedures um, and, um, and they talked a lot about HIF-1-alpha stabilizers. HIF-1-alpha stabilizers as a concept to replace EPO and if you watch there are three uh, of them uh, available uh, I think all of them are meanwhile uh, approved for clinical application and they are available and they can be called somewhere. This is here in uh, Kalman Chemicals in, a, in, a, in a, a chemical company, but you can buy them, but the prices are extremely ho high. The dosage are rather high. The half-life time is rather high. And whenever, whenever an athlete takes this to replace erythropoietin, uh, he has a chemical in his body which is detectable for days and which need to be taken at high dosages at a very high uh, price. I, I, I cannot see a practical motivation to do this uh, instead of um, using EPO. Uh, and in this uh, uh, court case, in this operation bloodletting, uh, the, the um, discussion was accordingly. So um, that's one. Um, the, the goal was to um, to adjust the blood profile. So here the athlete was very concerned about his low reticulocytes. They were very, very well informed. Athletes were perfectly informed uh, about their blood profiles. And here one, one of the athletes was concerned about low reticulocyte, which is a high off score. So this would, would easily uh, uh, result in a positive uh, doping finding. And, and the physician, uh, the advisor said, with E, e means EPO, uh, you need to increase uh, the reticulocytes and uh, doesn't understand why this, this happened at a high hemoglobin, such a low reticulocyte. And he, he um, advised the athlete to take uh, EPO. And um, And this was uh, the, the practical case, the practical uh, procedure where the athlete um, uh, was, was taken very low EPO concentration, uh, 300 uh, international units, which is indeed quite low. This, they, they took EPO not to increase their, blood, uh, their number of uh, red blood cells. They just uh, used uh, the uh, erythropoietin to uh, adjust their um, their individual hematological profile. So to hide that they did some blood transfusion. It's not erythropoietin, it's no, lo no longer a measure for increasing uh, oxygen transfer. It's only useful to adjusting the blood profile after uh, the, uh, after the uh, blood transfusion. Uh, and then there was a uh, uh, discussion uh, be between the athletes, uh, there were thousands of pages of, of, of documents in, uh, in the court files and there were, for instance, a, a discussion about the physiologist who uh, advertised somehow uh, that uh, they were talking about HIF-1-alpha stabilizers here and, and, and he said, I know a lot of them, of athletes, 60%, uh, sometimes he said 70% of the athletes were taking HIF-1-alpha stabilizers, which was could not be substantiated. That was a, a, a pure marketing uh, uh, statement. Uh, and in contrast, the athlete, uh, the only athlete in the field who has taken HIF-1 alpha stabilizers, so those powders, 15 milligrams of those strange uh, uh, powders, four times 10 milligrams per week in this case, 
he has used this and, and then he has uh, complained that his uh, um, blood profile, hemoglobin, uh, hematocrit and reticulocytes before the treatment and after the treatment was identical, it was perfectly identical and he, uh, uh, the, 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 the physiologist said, uh, I know a lot of uh, athletes swearing uh, of this, on this product, he, he didn't know anybody and the only statement was, was this one, it doesn't work at all. It, it is a very, very dubious that they, did, they didn't have a reliable sources. They bought it from pharmaceutical com uh, from, from chemical companies. It's, it's not uh, officially available. And they had some uh, dubious green powder uh, and uh, took it and it didn't, didn't work. So it was highly, highly, uh, a high amount of speculation. And if you compare th th this reality, and I, I think this is the, the reality in this group, there were uh, 20 endurance athletes involved in this, uh, in this uh, operation uh, and there were very, very detailed documents. Not complete, but there were a lot of detailed statements on what they really did. Uh, and I can assure you that HIT-1 alpha stabilizer was only a, a major uh, speculation uh, and it was never set to a reality, it was never used in practice. They were very well uh, informed about the detection, uh, uh, but the detection uh, potential and they immediately reacted when there was a positive doping case worldwide. They were first in cycling, uh, Rodox should start a doping case and they immediately learned that this is no longer usable because it's detectable. So the feedback was, was uh, rapid, uh, but the systematics about um, administration time, administration dosage was uh, disastrous. So uh, co compared, compared to, the all, uh, to the other concepts, so the, the blood transfusion was perfectly organized. The uh, replacement with, with uh, Erythropoietin was perfectly organized and, uh, and uh, combined with a very high uh, standard of knowledge. They knew what they did, but as soon as they were running outside this uh, traditional box, there was total ignorance and they didn't know uh, what uh, to do. Uh, and that's why the, uh, uh, the proactive research is, from my point of view, sometimes dangerous. There are thousands. Uh, compounds out there, thousands of compounds which are potential drug candidates. And you, you cannot uh, detect all of them, you cannot test all of them because, because testing means you need to have administration studies, uh, you need to have um, analytical procedures uh, available and uh, legally defensible thresholds and so on. And it is absolutely impossible. You can just sh speculate and choose some of them and if you are lucky you have some positive cases, uh, but in total there are much more candidates than can be uh, rapidly included in screening procedure. That, that must be uh, admitted. And, so, and, and sometimes or very often I, I had the feeling that th those uh, investigation of a new substance is doping inspiration rather than doping prevention because whenever a, a new compound is, uh, is investigated and data are published, then immediately in, in the uh, bodybuilding uh, scene, those uh, compounds come up, uh, they, they become available, they are referred to scientific literature, uh, and uh, I, I, I'm quite sure that many, many of those developments are triggered by uh, anti-doping research. Uh, second part, um, much shorter, is what I call re retrospective innovation, uh, which I want to show you on the basis of the uh, good old oral Turin bowl, which was in the 1980s, uh, the, the major uh, anabolic steroid, uh, which, which was uh, used in Eastern Germany. So this was a publication in, in, in the newspapers of those days in the, in the early 1990s, where the annual dosages of athletes, of all high rank athletes were published. So it was quite clear that th this was the most relevant uh, drug in the 1980s. Um, and uh, most interestingly, when you, when you uh, look at the, uh, the, the retesting uh, activities after the Olympic Games in Beijing or in London, uh, there were 
13 gold, 22 uh, silver, 20 uh, bronze medal stripped from uh, athletes due to cheating, and these cheating cases were to a major part due to oral turinabol, uh, thanosolol, and oxandrolone. And all those compounds had in common that they are very, very old, very well known, uh, and in principle de detectable for a very long time. Uh, but detection uh, is always based on markers in the body. So it's, it's never the, the administered steroid uh, which is detected. It is always biotransferred and, and the detection in urine is based on biotransformation products. Uh, and there's a lot, a lot of variety uh, as to concentrations and especially <coughs> length of detection. And there's a lot of uh, upcoming long-term metabolites. And this is maybe the, the, the uh, biggest innovation in doping uh, analysis in the past ten, year, 10 years, that um, long-term metabolites of conventional or, or traditional uh, anabolic steroids were identified. Uh, even if you don't like the chemistry, I, I try to, uh, to, to illustrate what, what happens there. This is an oral turinabol molecule. And this is not excreted as such. You can take two uh, tablets uh, and, and uh, the, the oral tunable itself will not be detectable, uh, at least not for a long time. So uh, one, day, one day after it is completely um, uh, excreted or, or metabolized to other uh, preparations. And this is basic uh, uh, biochemistry. So there are hydroxyl group which may be attached here somewhere. Uh, and there are many, many known reactions. But what happens here is that uh, after long studies, and this was ironically done by the laboratory in Moscow, uh, which, was, uh, uh, which was responsible, so uh, the, the country was, was responsible for the vast majority of those positive tests. And the same, the, the, the lo local laboratory uh, did this investigation and it's just as an illustration. So, so over here are two double bonds which are which are removed. Then there's a, a hydroxy group which is formed here. A uh, sulfate group is attached here. Then there's a very change, uh, strange movement of the methyl group here. Uh, then there's a hydroxylation, and finally there is a glucuronization. So there's a nine-step biotransformation, which is totally irrelevant. No, nobody in, in, in pharmaceutical industry is interested about this because this is not a, a pharmaceutical active compound. The, the only thing is that this uh, res rests in the body for extremely long time period and as to now we don't know how long. There, there are proven cases that uh, athletes uh, were found positive month after the last administ administration. And uh, in the beginning of doping analysis, you, you had the chance to identify two or three days of, 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 those, uh, of those markers. And now we are in the situation to see it for a month and uh, extremely long time period, of course, depending on uh, the uh, administration and amount. And, th and this is uh, the, the, the most revolutionary uh, aspect and the, the, the majority of the positive cases which we find in the laboratory is due to those uh, long-term metabolites which are existing for stanozosolol, for oxandrolone, um, and uh, drostanolone and, and so on. It's very, very old compounds, uh, but only with these new uh, uh, techniques or with this uh, uh, new markers, they are successfully uh, detectable in uh, low uh, amounts. Uh, and, uh, and, th and this is quite characteristic for doping analysis. Nobody does this in forensics or also or in clinical uh, chemistry, uh, searching for a long-term marker uh, of uh, anabolic agents. So what I, what I wanted to uh, conclude is uh, with mentioning that we are not we are not hunting athletes uh, we, we did a lot to um, protect athletes and uh, I've just uh, to conclude three short stories the first one was uh, uh, in the beginning of the century about the year of two, 2000 Nandrolone review anybody who was uh, active uh, in, in that time will remember that there was a, a large number of Nandrolone cases coming up at that time 
uh, the who is who in, in, in track and field, Linford, Christie, Merlin, Otte, uh, Dieter Baumann, so many, many athletes were found positive for this. Uh, and uh, it was a long search for, uh, for uh, reasons. And uh, one of them was uh, uh, mentioned here. Uh, there's some evidence that dandrolone is produced naturally in the body, but probably not in males. And then there was a statement here in, in this document, there's no evidence we are, we are aware of to suggest that nandrolone metabolites might be produced microbiology, uh, by microbiologically in urine uh, during storage. So it was denied that uh, in a stored urine sample it may happen um, that uh, nandrolone uh, prohibited substances can be formed by microorganisms and here uh, this was something we found after long research in 2005. Uh, if you just watch these different time points, zero, there's nothing and this is this, this is the amount of nandrolone here um, and uh, after one hour, two hour, four, eight, twenty hours of storage you have a urine sample which includes uh, microorganisms that doesn't have uh, that doesn't happen very often that's maybe one in uh, 500 cases but uh, uh, at a certain time we found one of those cases with one of those cases uh, in our hands and we could identify uh, that and we could prove that these finding may well be due to microorganisms and uh, and uh, and ever since the, the WADA was very more, much more careful to interpret those cases and they uh, admitted that this may happen and they took precautions. Um, and uh, th this was not an innovative research to identify doping, this was very innovative to uh, protect uh, athletes and prevent uh, unacceptable doping cases. This was another one. There was a story in Germany uh, in the 1990s, a swimmer uh, who was found positive with a testosterone, epitestosterone elevated ratio. Uh, and this was at that time uh, a threshold. Anybody who had more than six was suspected to uh, do uh, testosterone doping. Uh, and, um, and she pretended that she drank a lot of uh, raspberry something uh, a liqueur or so uh, um, and uh, she, she speculated that her, her deviation from normal was due to alcohol which was uh, denied at that time it's absolutely impossible but those cases uh, came up again and again uh, and we, here we have a, a very uh, obvious correlation ETG is an ethanol marker this is a time after drinking so I don't do only administration studies of uh, selected uh, androgen receptor modulators. Ethanol stu studies are much more enjoyable and, uh, <laughs> and I uh, contributed to this as well. Uh, um, so th this is the uh, ethyl glucuronide, an, an, an ethan ethanol marker, an ethanol drinking marker, and this was the testosterone, AP te uh, testosterone ratio, which clearly uh, went up. And this is a, another story which is uh, today acknowledged by WADA. So whenever there is a deviated or a, a suspicious testosterone, uh, epitestosterone uh, marker, then uh, the authority immediately asks for ETG, which is, which is uh, today tested in each uh, athlete sample. Uh, and whenever there is a positive uh, uh, ethanol drinking marker, then these will be introduced into this consideration and the, the number of suspicious TE uh, cases dropped dramatically after we've published this. So finally, uh, one closing case, testosterone. Again, this is a never ending story, uh, claimed butyrol, which, which was a never ending story because I think so with the, with the um, Olympic Games in uh, in Athens, there was an increasing number of, of claimed butyrol. There was uh, speculation or indication that uh, uh, meat was contaminated 
uh, from certain countries was uh, contaminated uh, with uh, clenbuterol because it is uh, a, a means uh, to increase muscle not only in athletes but al also in cattle and uh, the, fat f uh, the, the, the meat producing industry in uh, Mexico, in China, Guatemala, they were using uh, clenbuterol and eating uh, meat from those uh, countries could easily result in um, high uh, or in, in certain traces of, of clenbuterol in athletes' urine and there was uh, an influenza of clenbuterol cases at that time. Uh, and what we did is uh, uh, hair testing of those athletes and we found these were positive cases and we found there are two clusters, one very low and one very high and nothing in between um, and therefore our speculation is that this was a contamination and this was uh, abuse of clenbuterol. We did uh, some studies uh, with the support of WADA and of uh, FIFA. <coughs> this was from Mexican football players and Mexico was, was a center of, this, uh, of these um, problem and we found in uh, I think 70 percent of the Mexican football players we found we found indeed clenbuterol in their hair then we did an administration study here the red bars with a very low no with a uh, sub therapeutic administration and uh, this has proven that uh, under therapeutic dosage result in positive uh, uh, cases for urine and hair whereas uh, typical abuse cases should be over there and uh, with this we could identify four of the cases uh, th three of the cases that is being positive and that's those were weightlifters um, and uh, they had indeed uh, low concentrations low concentrations in urine over there that's very very low uh, and high, uh, really high concentrations in in hair so as as a message here for for this particular compound it was um, it was indicative that uh, hair testing is better suitable for differentiation uh, of abuse from uh, contamination than urine because those urine concentrations are uh, below the uh, threshold which is nowadays used as, a, as another as a third con con consequence uh, in uh, 2021 the WADA has uh, introduce new thresholds for clenbuterol to prevent those false positive, which I would like to call them, uh, clenbuterol cases following uh, meat contamination. So this, this is uh, what I wanted to uh, mention. Uh, finally, it's not, it's not our main purpose to, to blame athlete or, or to uh, to create positive cases, we spend a lot of, uh, uh, of energy uh, and of research to avoid uh, those uh, tricky uh, findings which kept, uh, kept us running uh, in, in sports in the last two decades qu quite a lot. Nandrolone uh, and testosterone to AP testosterone, th those cases were less spectacular but they, they were existing and claimed brutal. I don't know how many cases we've seen of those. Uh, low concentration and I, I think we did something uh, useful to to protect protect athletes uh, extra to the uh, improve of um, testing strategies for upcoming new compounds this was, was my my short summary I hope uh, that I uh, included something which is interesting for you thank you <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Thieme. We have a small present for you, <laughs> gift from Luxembourg to take with you to Dresden. Uh, alcohol. Uh, some, for my some ethanol. <laughs> yes. For my <laughs> <TV> ratio. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for this excellent and interesting lecture. I guess um, till Eric will start the next presentation, we have time for for one question. We will discuss it later. But if there is a question by the audio. Yeah, Annick Sachs. Annick Sachs is coming from the Luxembourg uh, National Agency of Anti-Doping and I'm happy to see you here. Hello. Yeah. Hello to everybody. Don't 
thank you a lot for this uh, very interesting and practical presentation. Just for your information, in 2017, we had a we tested uh, a cyclist positive for molydustat. And uh, I remember well my, uh, your colleague uh, Hans Geyer from uh, the lab in uh, Cologne, he called me and he was very excited because it was the first case they had at that time. And if I remember well, it was not yet uh, on the market, the product at that time. Maybe you correct me, but we had this positive case and it, wasn't, it was not a Luxembourg uh, cyclist, it was a cyclist that it the Luxembourg from another country. So just to add this information that we, we, we are aware of these, uh, these substances. Just uh, my question, our goal is of course also to protect the clean athletes. And I wanted to know how do you see this new regulation in the list 2022 with the change of glucocorticoids? Do you expect more positive cases with this new regulation because of because athletes and also their doctors or physios, they don't know the regulation well. Because I think it's a very, very complicated uh, regulation. When I read the summary, we have to pay attention of uh, how is your, what do you expect from the laboratory and uh, perspective and how, uh, how can agencies uh, prevent to have more positive cases? Thank you. So that's another half an hour presentation. <laughs> uh, just briefly, the, the molecular start, I think it's still that, that that's from Bayer, that's still not available. Another one, Roxalu start. Do they need to switch it on? No, you understand me, I think, without a mic. Uh, uh, Roxalu start was available, and it was amazing how reactive they were. In, 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 their, in their communication, uh, after two days, they, they, they read in the, in the newspaper that, that there's a Roxalus start case in, in cycling. I think they were all in cycling. Uh, and, and now we need to switch to another, to another powder. They didn't know how to spell it and they didn't know uh, the dosage, but they, they, they recognized it, is, it was found positive and now we uh, have to switch to another one. That, that was amazing to, uh, in, in, in their strategy. Yeah, glucocorticoids, that's, that's a never-ending story. And, and the beginning of the story is that it was put on the list without a clear intention because it's not, it's not anabolic, it's thought to be ergogenic somehow, and it's clear that, that it is abused. That's why, that's why it was put on the list. And there were data for cortisol and cortisone uh, available saying that um, concentration higher than 30 uh, in urine are indicative for abuse. That means for, for systematic uh, administration, which is prohibited and the local isn't. Um, and then they extended this 30 to all other glucocorticoids, which, which was a major stupidity because uh, they, they all behave different. There they are different administration routes, different half-life, uh, and they put all them together. Tree amsinolone acet acetonide was, was put together uh, with, with, with prednisolone, which is uh, bizarre. And, uh, and there was a long, uh, a long process to sort this out, or let's say to improve this. And, and now there is a certain improvement. I mean, the, for tree amsinolone, it was uh, reduced for, for prednisolone, prednisolone it, it was, uh, it's, it's much higher. Uh, it's a li little bit more realistic now, but uh, uh, the, the information policy is, is, is a nightmare because it was put on the 21 list uh, and then anybody objected because it, it is, there are two elements. It is no longer, local injections are, are no longer, so any injection is now, now prohibited. Before the, yeah. Yeah, before, before this, there was, there was a differentiation by, by a time point in competition and out of competition and by administration route. So local injection were, were, or, or intra-articulary injections were uh, permitted, permitted and, and, uh, and uh, uh, intravenous or whatever, or intramuscular or uh, were prohibited. Um, and, and now they, they have uh, strengthened the, the prohibition and they have adjusted the, the uh, reporting limits. Um, and last year there was a, a, a strong 
uh, objection from all sides. The, the, uh, the, the medical doctors were objecting be, because they have now uh, new therapeutic use exempt, uh, exemption uh, requirements. The TUE groups were not informed. The laboratories were not informed. Then the WADA has put, postponed it to 22, and today the situation is the same like last year. They, they didn't use the year uh, to, to inform uh, the parties. They just, they just uh, presented draft and draft, and I think yesterday we received a new clarification note for do a document which should come in, uh, in, into uh, uh, effect on, on January the 1st. And uh, we, are, we, are, we have no time to adjust methods, and I think the, the situation for, for the practitioners is quite the same. So it's, it's with, within, within two month time you, you are expected to change TUE and everything. So that's less than one, half an hour, but still not too complex.